Okay, so uh, today we're really thrilled to have Anru Zan from Duke University uh, presenting today. So he is an, assist, uh, an associate professor at Duke University in the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics, as well as a few other departments. Uh, his research um, is very well known. He's won numerous awards, um, including the NSF Career Grant um, in 2020. So today he will be speaking about tensor learning in 2020s methodology theory and applications. Um, thanks so much for the nice introduction and uh, for the invitation. Yeah, well, so it's my honor to speak at One World uh, Mind Seminar. I have been following the seminar series for quite a while. And, uh, it's my huge honor to be a speaker here. So I'm going to talk about my recent research on tensors. The tensors are array with one or multiple directions. In our usual context, we will refer to an order one tensor as a vector and order two tensor as a matrix. And in this talk, I'm particularly interested in a tensor of order three or higher. We can visualize this tensor as a cube uh, with each cell containing a value. So the tensors of order three or higher, we'll refer them as a higher tensor. And in mathematical notation, we use this calligraphic letter like this A to denote. And this A is the order D tensor. So it has D directions to denote each entry of this tensor. We need D indices, the I1 up to ID, where each IK is from one to PK. Here the PK is called the dimension of this tensor and D is called the order of this tensor. And if you're interested in this topic, I will refer to a 2009 survey paper by Tammy Koda and Bader, and uh, they have say a very say nice say, introduction of the decomposition of the tensor. Why people care about tensors? First of all, there are a lot of scientific problems where that can generate tensors. For example, neural image data analysis. Um, the goal of new image data analysis is to understand how our brains are wired and how to, to develop better, better treatment plans to cure the various the brain diseases. That's Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of technologies have been invented like uh, CT, MRI, PET, FMRI, EEG, and so on and so forth. And because our brain has 3D spatial structure, the usual MRI image is an order three tensor. And by say some specific formats, this EEG data, EEG data can also be formatted into a tensor. Uh, another application I want to mention is a real application that I have been encountered, uh, 4D stand image data analysis. I imagine we have interest in certain material, and we want to know the inside structure of it, we put it into the 4D stand the microscope. And on one side of this material, we put an electron probe, and the probe will shoot electrons that penetrate the material. On the other side, we, do the, we put a 2D camera to capture the signal. As you can imagine, on each location of this probe, and we have a 2D image. Because we are allowed to move this probe up and down, left and the right, in the end, we will have 2D of 2D images, and that's a, or a four tensor image. Um, the tensor also widely appear in sequencing data analysis, for example, in the microbiome data analysis, which I shall mention very specifically in the second part of this talk. Um, we have say microbiology sequencing reads from different subjects and uh, over say different type of bacteria and over different body sites of the subject. And you can immediately see it's our three tensor. And uh, some other sequencing technology may also yield tensor like the single cell data analysis. Um, hypergraph and the, the dynamic network may also involve tensors. And for example, we are all living in the social network, like Facebook network. In the regular graph, um, each of the two subjects are either connected or not connected. 
And then this regular graph will induce a JSONC matrix. Well, the i j s n g is equal to one if and only if the i's node and the j's node are connected and zero otherwise. Uh, in practice, we'll see connections among two or even more nodes. For example, three or four people can cl collaborate on one paper, and five or six people can collaborate on one grant. So our connection can involve the so-called hyper edge, say in addition to the regular edge. Well, the hyper edge may include three or even more say, nodes. In this scenario, we not only have a JSONC matrix, but a JSONC tensor to describe. And then the tensor will naturally appear. A slightly different but closely related concept is the dynamic social network analysis. Um, still, let's take a look at the Facebook network. At a single endpoint, uh, we know, say, all people can be, say, characterized uh, by a graph and that will induce a genesis the matrix. But as time goes, you can imagine that, say, the connection will change over time. The friends and enemy can become, the friends can become enemy and vice versa. So if we just stack the different time points together, we have a dynamic social network, and then we we'll have not only one, the agency matrix, but a series of agency matrices, add them together, that is the tensor. And tensor also appears in other applications like a matrix values time series. Uh, imagine we're interested in say, a certain financial matrix among the different uh, say, companies and over a certain period of time. Immediately from this picture, you will see, ah, it's a tensor, not a matrix. And suppose we are first interested in the covariance among the different financial metrics among different companies, then there'll be a covariance over all the two metrics, there'll be all the four tensor. And another application of the measure is about the multivariate and high dimensional longitudinal data, like the electronic health records and variable measurements and so on and so forth. The data essentially are tensors. And why is that? Let's take a look at this illustrative picture. Suppose we have the different people, say in the data EHR database, and then we observe their behavior along a certain period of time. And the doctors take different sorts of features or measurements for these subjects. So you can immediately see that we will have all the three tensor, where the three directions are people, time, and the features. And such type of data widely appears in a lot of high dimensional, say, longitudinal data. Um, so for those examples, tensor directly appear as a format of the data, but in a, another series of problems, although the data themselves are not tensors, but if we just format them into a tensors, things can be easier to visualize. And for example, the interaction pursue model. Okay, and again, we, let's take a look at this, this typical regression model, right? Y equals to beta zero plus the main factor in summation of xi or beta i, i from one to p. And in practice, we often not only have main factor of this covariate, we also have pairwise interactions. Now, if we introduce the matrix value time pairwise interaction, then we will have this matrix covariance say, parameter involved. If we have say, a triple wise interactions involved, then we have a tensor say, formatted say, parameter involved. And this overall high order ingression model looks complicated, but there's a simple way to rewrite it. Why i equals to the inner product of sine b plus epsilon i. The a i here is nothing else but the tensorized covariate, uh, which are the, the true covariates plus the intercept, the, the outer product of the itself of three times, and the B here is the higher interaction effect term that incorporates all the parameters of interest in this interaction pursuit model. So actually solving this model and uh, will be more say, straightforward. We can apply some sensor regression method to solve, and which is 
easier to handle than the original interaction pursuit model. Um, I also want to mention another important class of problems, as mentioned with the mixture models. Uh, a mixture model is a concept, which means that we have an overall population and incorporate the subpopulations. And there are a lot of the important instances of the mixture model, like the Gaussian mixture model, helping modeling, either Markov process, independent component analysis, and so on and so forth. Um, the goal of the mixture model estimation is to infer the individual subpopulation from observing samples generated from the overall population. And in order to handle these scenarios, and there's a widely say, used uh, method called the method of moments. So if we have, say, the samples, then we often need to consider the first moment, which is the average of the sum of all the vectors. Or the second moment is the vector times the vector transpose average. But even the first two moments cannot used to say fully characterize the Gaussian mixture model. We often need a high order moments and because that contains more information. For example, the order three moments, vector times vector times vector again, then average, that's the order three tensor. The high order tensor will naturally appear in this type of okay, problems. Um, I also want to mention a very, very important application of tensors and uh, DeepMind has making constantly making splashes over the past few years. And for example, this one. They discover a faster matrix multiplication algorithms using reinforcement learning. And the, the paper, the results are published in this the nature paper. Okay, they basically utilize this connection and in order to achieve faster matrix times matrix is equivalent to solve. Uh, or three, say, tensor decomposition problems are slightly uh, better. And basically, the team from the mind and just treat this problem as the reinforcement learning task. And then they developed a new algorithm and find out a, a, a faster solution for matrix multiplication. And uh, it's somewhat surprising to see that, yeah, there's a, such a close connection with and much matrix multiplication, which is uh, one of the most fundamental problems in human analysis, and two, the tensor decomposition problems. And tensor also appears in uh, modern machine learning. Like, uh, I would say that the Markov decision process, the prototypical model for the reinforcement learning is, is essentially tensor because uh, after agents, they pick one action, then for example, we'll jump from one state to another state according to the certain say, mark of the rule. And then if we just stack all the different say mark of mark of kernels together, and that's immediate, you can immediately see that's a tensor. By utilizing some the lower end structure, we'll be able to say, achieve reinforcement learning faster. And, and for deep learning, say tensor also widely appear, like the convolutional neural network. You can this is one schematic plot. You can immediately see that some of the intermediate arrays are tensors. I've also emphasized that the tensor provides a very interesting testing ground to study complicated phenomena and methods in modern machine learning. For example, in the deep learning mode, deep learning problems, and uh, scholars see interesting phenomena, for example, over prime translation, implicit bias, implicit regularization, or neuron collapse. And then it will be quite challenging to analyze this phenomena on the regular the deep learning model. So some people just take one step back and uh, take a look at the tensor decomposition problem. Oh, for tensor decomposition, we'll be able to observe this phenomena probably as well. And this result will shed light to the, the phenomenon in the general say, tensor decomposition. So, so in this phenomenon um, in the modern machine learning. And deep learning. Okay, from this example, I hope I convinced to you that uh, high order tensor data sets widely appear in modern applications. And uh, for some problems, although the tensor does not directly appear in the format of the tensor of the data set, but the tensor can still be useful in this problem. I think that the high order tensor problems are very charming. 
but at the same time, the higher order tensor problems can be harder because the tensor problems are far more than essential for matrices. Uh, because first of all, the tensor have more weight structures than the matrices. I was I will as why we illustrate later. If we just ignore some of the structures and only say treat the tensor as a matrix, we might say only obtain the suboptimal results. And also the tensor overcome with high dimensionality. And as we have mentioned earlier, uh, that neural image example, uh, the typical size of uh, MR image is about 100 by 100 by 100. It's not a super high resolution image, but it already includes one million of voxels. And so simultaneously to analyze a thousand images could, be, could have in, induced a lot of computational burden. So there's a lot of computational issue here. And last but not least, many important concepts of tensors like uh, the singular value decomposition and uh, of many of important concepts for matrices like the singular value decomposition, nuclear norm, spectral norm, and so on and so forth. They can be either say not well defined for tensors or it, they are defined but can be hard to evaluate in general. So that will cause our extra layers of difficulties. After working on this topic for a few years, I think I think the following sentence can summarize the current status of the research of tensor. I think tensor is a very important interdisciplinary topic in the modern data science. A lot of tensor problems are motivated by domain knowledge. Then we found that because of the recent advancement in statistics optimization and probability, and this actually turns the concept interact with each of the intermediate topics. And I think it's a very important interdisciplinary topic of tensor. Okay, so because of the time limit, I'm not able to say, tell you all the things we have been doing over the years. I want you to share with you some of the interesting and fundamental problems I've been thinking about. First of all, the tensor SVD. So SVD is singular value decomposition. It's one of the most the most important tools for dimension reduction. So if we have a matrix data sets, uh, SVD, the goal of the SVD is to find the most representative low dimensional structure of the data matrix. So if you have a data matrix here, we apply SVD, we can decompose it into a thin loading matrix and another thin component matrix, approximately. And this SVD is closely related to the principal component as is PCA, that is to find a one or multiple direction to explain most of the variance in this database. And for example, uh, we have data cloud like this, and then this direction represents the first PC, and this represents the second. Um, so the recently, and in the statistics and machine learning literature, we have seen many, say, extensions of the traditional SVD and the PCA to handle the high dimensional scenario. For example, sparse PCA and sparse SVD to handle the sparsity structure, and robust PCA and robust SVD to handle possible heavy tail noise of the outliers, and kernel PCA and SVD to handle possible linearity in this low dimensional structure. But those mostly focus on matrix data. But if we just move one way ahead, how about the tensor problem? And how do you apply SVD or PCA on tensors? And at least uh, yeah, there are some results on the R equally one scenario, but general framework for tensor SVD for a rank R greater than or equal to two is not well defined or solved yet. So you may wonder why we need to consider SVD um, for a tensor, and there are many reasons. I just want to give you one specific reason and about the computational image denoising I have mentioned at the beginning. So our application is this fully scanning transmission electron microscope. Um, let's take a look at this schematic plot. We're interested in this material, right? On one side of the material, we put a focus electron probe and this should electrons penetrate the material and then we get a diffraction pattern image like this. And for each of the probe position, we can get a 2D image. So there are two indices in this tensor image, Rx, Ry, that's a probe position, and the K is Ky, 
those are fixed allocations. And as you can imagine that for fixed RxRy, we get a, this type of say, a circle shaped image. And for fixed uh, KxKy, we can get another type of image. And both of these two type of images are important for this material scientist to investigate the inside structure of the material. But on the other hand, you can also see that these images are highly noisy and photon limited. The reason is that we cannot put too much, say, too many electrons to penetrate the material at the same time because it will burn the material. So we can only get these noisy images. Um, so to them, the adequate denoising is very important. Unfortunately, we have, say, not, one, not only one image, but a stack of images. So by incorporating this tensera structure, and we're helpful to denoise those images using the tensor SPD method. So that's why we want to introduce the following general statistical framework for tensor SPD. We observe y equals to x plus z. A y is the observable, say, tensor, which could be a stack of the noisy images. S is the low rank tensor, which is a stack of ground truth images. And Z is the noise. Uh, we view it as the difference between Y and X. Our goal is to recover the high dimensional low rank structure of this X. Um, before we further proceed, what we still need to figure out what does it mean by a low rank tensor? Um, a low rank, in the in this literature about tensors is not unified defined. And we will use this concept called the Tucker decomposition and Tucker rank. And if we have this tensor X here, and it has three ways, P1, P2, and P3 on the three direct dimensions, then we are able to say decompose it into a quartz S times three loading matrices U1, U2, and U3 along its three directions. Well, the dimension of these three matrices are P1 by R1, P2 by R2, and P3 by R3. And among all the decomposition that makes this equation even, the one that has the smallest uh, core size, R1, R2, R3, say it's the size of the core, and they are called the packet rank, and the corresponding decomposition are called the packet decomposition. Um, we can visualize, we can view this decomposition as extension from the matrix SPD, because we now all know that if we have a rank R matrix, then the SVD of this applying SVD, we can write this X into a P by R matrix U1 times R by R matrix S and times R by P matrix U2. So this tensor target decomposition can be viewed as the extension from the SVD to the tensor scenario. Um, okay, with say this target decomposition in mind, you know, we'll be able to say write down the tensor SPD statistical model. We we'll observe y, and y is equal to x plus z, and x here has the target decomposition, s times u1 times u2 times u3 along its three directions, and z is the tensor, say with ID Gaussian noise for simplicity, with a mean zero and value sigma squared. And UK here is the loading matrix, and S is the core tensor. So this is the pictorial illustration of the overall model. Our goal is to estimate this original tensor X as well as the loading U1, U2, U3. Okay, how can we do that? At this stage, although we probably don't know how to do SVD for tensor yet, but uh, we can do SVD for matrix. We apply the very classic idea HOI. And uh, we can initialize with high order simplified decomposition HOSVD and introduced by this group of people in the year of 2000. And this is a picture illustration. And we can say, imagine say this turns a Y as a big potato, then because this potato has three ways, there will be three ways to cut this potato into French fries this way, this way, and this way. And then we can apply this mode one unfolding and get three matrices, P1 times P2, P3, and P2 times P3, P1, and P3 times P1, P2 respectively. Then we apply this SVD on each individual matrix and get three, say, 
all the matrices u1 hat, u2 hat, u3 hat zero. Um, or this uh, initialization of this overall procedure, although it's probably not going to be optimal, but at least it provides a one to start, a starting point. And HOSPD is one possible solution. But actually, there are faster procedure and uh, available in the literature, like a sequential truncated HOSPD, uh, which means that we do this say, SVD for three loads, three modes, say sequentially. And uh, I will also want to argue say that so this UK and uh, from HOSVD is nothing else but a plug-in estimator. The reason is that if we apply the true tensor X into the same say pipeline, and we will get an exact uh, say UK the, the loading of interest. So this UK hat zero is nothing else but a, a plug-in estimator for this UK here because of this. Okay, the second step is power iteration. And um, so the overall procedure can be illustrated by this picture. Instead of the, use the, using the whole tensor to do this job, we want to say project this tensor uh, to, to update. We want to use, uh, instead of using the overall tensor to update our estimate for this U1 hat, we want to project this Y onto the substates spanned by U2 hat and the UC hat. And then we get a, a dimension reduced beam, a matrix like this, and then calculate the SVD again. And then that is U1 hat. And we do this sequentially for U1 hat, U3 hat, and U3 hat, and uh, iteratively. And the mathematical formula can be described by them. And we do this until convergence or the maximum number of iterations is reached. And basically, power iteration can refine initialization. And then we're ready to talk about the um, theoretical, statistical theoretical analysis. Uh, we find, first, I have to define this signal to noise ratio concept, lambda or sigma. The lambda here is defined as this, which is the least non zero singular value of each matrixization of this matrix X, where this K is from one, two, three. A noise level sigma is equal to the standard deviation of each entry of this noise tensor. And what we can show is that as long as the lambda of sigma is greater than the constant times P2 3 V quarters, if we assume the the three dimension of this tensor of the same order as P, then we have the following guarantee on the recovery as, as the estimation error for the loading, as well as the estimation error for this X. And uh, here I want to mention that for this targeting organization in this UK, they are not identifiable, say, as a matrix, but they are identifiable as a subspace because if we put a rotation matrix row here, then we essentially represent the same subspace. So that's why when we define the loss, yeah, we have to define in this way. We put a rotation, say, in front of this UK. It's a, a, after this UK here. Okay. So these are the statistical upper bounds. And these upper bounds actually rate optimal because we can further introduce information theoretical lower bounds, which matches this upper bound. And then I only want to mention that for simplicity, we presented this theory for all the three terms of scenario. But the scenario can also be generalized to say all the D terms of SVD. In general, all the D tensor SVD also exhibit three different phases. As long as lambda of sigma is greater than or equal to C times PD over four, then we have efficient algorithm that can optimally estimate the loadings and the X. When lambda of sigma is less than P to one half, we cannot develop any algorithm that consistently estimate the loadings and the X. Well, lambda of sigma is between these two thresholds, P2 one half and P2 D over four. Then we can show that the, if we, the overall, say, the original model here is a parametric model. We can just write down the likelihood and try to find out the maximum likelihood estimator. If we can do so, we can optimally estimate the loading and X. But if we do that, we we'll need to solve a highly non convex problem. Uh, it requires, say, maybe super polynomial time. 
So we can further show that if we really restrict ourselves to polynomial type algorithm, possibly no algorithm can perform this, this can, can solve this problem consistently. Then here we have two so quick remarks. If D is equal to two, then the problem reduced from tensor to matrix. Then let's see what's going on here. When D is two, one half is equal to two over four, which means there is no say, moderate significant to noise ratio regime here. We only have strong and weak. In this scenario, and we don't have a gap between the computational statistical gap and the computational statistical gap closes, which is indeed the case, right? We have been say working on say SVD and PC, and we've been utilizing this in data analysis for more than hundred years. And we never heard of the computational statistical gap. But when we move on from matrix to a tensor scenario then we have to deal with this moderate signal to noise ratio regime. So there is a scenario that the problem is statistically possible, but computationally challenging. So what I want to say is that tensor SPD is not only statistically, but also computationally challenging. challenging. And uh, this scenario not only appear in the, in the matrix and in, in this tensor SPD scenarios, but it appears in a wide range of scenarios and in the tensor data analysis. I think that's the, another charming part of the tensor learning problems. And now let's move on to another, the, the application I have mentioned at the beginning of this talk and uh, about computational image denoising. And uh, so we have a stack of say 40 same images like this. And those are raw data and apply tensor SVD. And then we get a denoised image data. Um, we can see that this denoised images are clear and are clean and smooth. Although what we have been using is only the low likeness among different images. We didn't use any say wavelet or say kernel based method to, to smooth these images. And in the end, the overall performance was great. And uh, yeah, well, our collaborator and the material scientist at uh, the Medicine are pretty happy about this result. And then with their help, we can also do some simulation studies. There's one advantage in simulation, we know the ground truth. So we simulate uh, uh, the noisy images and that mimics the crystal structure of the strontium titanate. So those are the true image data and the noisy image data. Apply um, the algorithm and get these denoised images. And we can see that, well, the denoised and the true images are very close to each other, right? Uh, look very similar to each other. Uh, we can probably spot the difference of these two images. If we further calculate the structure similarity index measure, and we'll see that this value are very close to one. The SSM is standard the measure to quantify the performance of a denoising algorithm. And one means the perfect denoise and the overall performance was great in this scenario. And we can see another scenario that's uh, mimic the structure uh, as so the crystal structure of molar crystalline silicon with an anomaly in the middle of this same material. Again, we have this true image, we have the noise image, I have the noise, we have the noisy image generated by a computer and apply the algorithm and get the noise images. Now, we still calculate the structure similarity index measure and the value here are still the very close to one. Um, so we can see that the outside area, well, the periodical say holds better and the performance is better. For the inside structure, the performance is worse than the outside area, but the overall performance is still say, quite reasonable. All right, so that's all I want to talk about um, for the first uh, project about Tensei SVD. So let me stop here and ask you if you have any questions. All right, so 
for the sake of time, let's move on to another scenario about the function tensor three D and with applications in high dimensional longitudinal data. So the motivating example is about the human microbiome. Yeah. We are living in this world not alone, but with trillions of microbiome cells. They are living on and in our body. So in our in our human, actually half of the cells belongs to ourselves and half of the cells belongs to the microbes. And they play tremendous roles um, to our human health. And so that's why in the recent years in bioinformatics, it's about statistics, the anal analysis of the human microbiome have been a very, say, hot topic. So the motivating example is this ECAN data sets um, generated by, say, say, it's reported by this paper. So in this study, there are 60 and 93 CFICA samples collected from 42 infants. Among them, 24 are vaginal born and 18 of them are C-sectional born. And uh, then original plan is that among these 42 babies, and the doctors they suggest them to, to revisit the heart clinic once every month for year zero to year one, and then once in two months from year one to year two. Okay, that was the original plan. But the real the real situation is that some of the baby just drop up in the middle of the study and they never show up, and some of the baby. Um, maybe it's a visit not erect, so not in time. Uh, so even say three times within a week and something like that. And this plot just shows the overall visits, the performance of these babies. So this y-axis represents different baby IDs and the x-axis are the days of life since they are born. And for each dot, and that's one visit to the clinic and we can, you can visualize each part represent a vector, which means the sequencing recount vector. Okay, so what happens is that from this say, visit pattern, you can see that the samples are taken at a different time points across different subjects. And we, as we have mentioned, each point they represents the high dimensional feature. And also a very important fact is that and this baby are not belongs to one group, but two groups. One is C-sectional born, one is the vaginal born. And uh, it's a tensor data because the three directions are different babies, different time, and uh, different, uh, say, bacteria, say, composition. And uh, we cannot put a tensor on the board. And what we can do is to produce some, say, dimensional reduced, the information from this, say, from this table, so the dimension redu reduction is a crucial first step to visualize this data set and to the analysis as well as to interpretations. Okay, so is there any existing tools in the statistical machine learning literature we can use? At least uh, there are two series of work that can potentially be applied, like the function data analysis literature. In the multivariate functional principle analysis, MFPCA, it is the um, the closest one that's to our work. And unfortunately, it only works for moderately large number of variable P here. And in our scenarios, the number of features is the number of type of bacteria can reach to hundreds or even thousands. And also the FDA, the functional data analysis literature usually only focus on the same population. And we want to characterize the similarity among the people in this population. But here we clearly have two say different babies and vaginal bone and C-sectional bone. So this line of result method may not the best uh, say, uh, say suitable. And uh, in another series of uh, papers like in the low rank tensor decomposition literature that we have mentioned at the first half of the talk, usually they assume the same sample date time points of our sample and uh, there are, then if we apply them, those results, we have to impute the missing value at first. And uh, also the structure along the functional model are not directly utilized. And this tensor 
This is because this tensor is different from the previous tensor. There are time involved. And time is very special because it has a sequential say, information. If we just permute or shuffle the time information, that information will be totally lost. And we wish to develop a method that can be, that can say characterize or utilize the structure along the time mode. Okay, so because motivated by this, we want to introduce a new framework called the function tensor SVD. And uh, let's assume this one. I will assume that there's an underlying the tensor Y circle and we say three modes as the subjects and features and time. And this Y circle will contain some unobserved underlying functions of N subject and P features. And the Y circle here is approximately CP low rank in the sense that it can be decomposed into a summation of say the rank one components and plus a remainder term. And this Y circle is not observable um, say everywhere, but only on a set of time points and with an error here. And uh, then how we observe is this Y here, IJT. And our goal is to estimate or recover the singular vectors and functions A, B, and Kasai here from the observations of this Y, IJT. So you may wonder why we want to estimate A, B, Kasai here, and what can we make use of them? And from this slide, I want to briefly explain, but in the later real data analysis, we will explain the, in more details. First of all, for this A, a1 hat all the repeat all the way to n he hat, those are subject to singular vectors. So they can be used to say serve as dimensionally reduced features, and they can help us to visualize the different subjects and help us to class the different subjects. And the feature are singular vectors, b1 hat all the way to bp hat, and those are weights to aggregate uh, uh, a lot of high dimensional features into a few a number of meta features, which is to reduce the dimension of the features and to identify the key features in meta features. And for this C hat, those are singular functions. And uh, different from A and B, its function is smooth curve rather than say discrete vectors. They can illustrate the key component of the feature trend. So we'd like to introduce our algorithm here. So we initialize in this way and um, for A and B here, then basically different from the previous example, and we want to say minimize the, the L2 loss, the bound square loss, and plus a regularization term, which is uh, some tuning parameter times the RKHS norm of C here. And the uh, RKHS norm say is basically a very important say a norm to guarantee the smoothness of your estimate of the cutty head. And, and to minimize this, and the idea is actually very simple, as you see, as the previous setting, we we'll first want to say fix P and C and minimize of A. That is the least square problem. Then we fix A and C and minimize over B, again, least square. And then we fix A and B and minimize of C here. And that would be essentially a RKH non-parametric regression. And uh, we can apply some important tool like the representative re representative theorem and also cast this problem into a this square problem. And in the end, we can say estimate say the one common at, at one time, update the data, and then estimate the singular values as well. And we choose the the number of ranks based on the BIC criterion like this. And then we come to the informal theorem that guarantees the algorithm work. So this theorem, the original theorem looks complicated. It essentially tells us this story. And first of all, yeah, we have this say, as long as the mu, which is the incoherence among different components is small, and we have a reasonable time Break density m and the, this is singular value lambda mean is reasonably say large, which means that the signal is well separated from the noise. 
and also we have a good initialization. And the amplitude of uh, the residual of your say, the CPT composition, the, and the Z here is reasonably small, and the, the tau here is reasonably small. And then we say that this the function to C is absolutely continuous and with the first alpha derivative to be square integrable, it belongs to a sublet space of alpha solder. Then we can show that, that your estimation error, the distance of the A hat to the true A, B hat to the true B, and C hat to the true C can be bounded by this term. And this term incorporates both the parametric say, error and some sort of non-parametric error here. Um, then with the theory in mind, and let's take a look at yeah, the real data analysis, which is the example we have explained at the beginning. So we have say 42 babies, and some are vaginal born and some, some are C-sectional born. And our goal is to visualize and cluster subjects and the aggregate features into meta features and then learn the trend of the component measures over time. And then we well, first add the point back to all counts and then apply this log, say, central log, tra log transformation and then apply this proposed FTSD method on the log transformed data sets. Then a BIC criterion tells us that we should set rank equals to two. And then uh, with, let's take a look at some result here. The first of all, this is the plot for KC1 and KC2 hats. And these are the plot for A1 hat and A2 hat. Now we can see that for the subject single log actors, the component one doesn't do a very good job to separate these two type of babies, but the component two did a, a better job. And then we should fo probably focus on the component two other than the component one. If you want to, to tell the, the major, say, microbound difference among these two type of babies. And then we we'll take a look at the B2 hat. B2 hat is the second feature loading. We use that as, as the a loading vector that the weight to aggregate say, all this tensor into a matrix. And then we draw this spaghetti plot and well, the X axis is the days since the baby was born and the Y axis is the value of this aggregated feature or the meta feature. Now we can see that these two baby are seen so very say, well separated. If we just draw the mean curve for the successional born and the vaginal born baby uh, with this 95% the confidence band, and we will immediately see that all well, these two babies are well separated uh, along this say, meta feature. Now you can see that the difference between these two meta feature just corresponds to the second component we can see here. So that's I think that briefly speaking, what happens here is that the KC1, the first component measure or the characterize the similarity or the homogeneity among these two type of babies. Uh, the second common will just tell the difference among the sectional born and the vaginal born babies. And uh, so for this meta feature, this one issue, yeah, the meta feature is the weighted average of a lot of high dimensional features. And uh, it's usually very hard to interpret, just like uh, when we do PCA analysis, the interpretation can be an issue. But fortunately, we have this B2 hat here. We can tell that uh, which feature, which bacteria has the largest weight and which bacteria maybe have the smallest weight. Uh, we, take a two, uh, we, we take a look at this B2 hat here and take the, the four entries with the largest the absolute values. And then we find out the corresponding bacteria here and we draw the spaghetti plot of these four, four bacteria as well as the mean plus the, the, and the confidence bands. Now we can see that at least the these two back, first the two bacteria tells these two two type of babies they quite separate. Uh, to separate these two type of babies quite well. So these are the two the, the I think the characteristic important bacteria that that these two babies will have, have very different conditions and, uh, when they are, after they are born. Okay, so I think, uh, I think I'm think i a little bit running out of time, so I think I will just skip this third scenario. I also want to mention 
I just want to mention that some of the other things our team have been working on. So we have mentioned that the tensor is VD and the function tensor is VD, right? Function tensor is D is suitable to apply tensor data with time involved, and the regular tensor is VD is applicable to the tensor without time. And we also have sparse tensor is VD, where we, if there's a, only some sparsity structure in the data sets. And in some, say, single cell data analysis examples, and the, the different cell, the cell types, and different feature, uh, features may exhibit the, the co occurrence some module and to translate to a mathematical language. That means that there are clusters, bicluster or triclusters. And we have this high order Lloyd algorithm, the bicluster and triclustering algorithm, and to measure, to handle that. And, and also, the example we have mentioned here uh, about the tensor of order three or four, but what if we have a mark high order, say, mark of transition, say, tensor? Then the tensor, if the tensor order is order 10 or so, and how can we handle that? In that scenario, we might need a, a better structure other than a target decomposition. And for example, we apply this the tensor chain decomposition, and then we have this ultra high order tensor SVD results. As we have mentioned, tensor is related to reinforcement learning. And uh, all the error we have mentioned in this talk so far was about uh, Gaussian. But if we have other generalized loss, like uh, Bernoulli, say, Parson, and so on and so forth, we can have this generalized tensor learning. And uh, due to the time limit, I don't have enough. We, we cannot mention the tensor in remaining optimization or over parameterization work here. Um, and also, last but not least, the tensor learning and a lot of tensor problems is related to this concept called the computational statistical trade-off. Um, this is the last slide of my talk. From this talk, I hope I convinced you that the tensor data widely appear and tensor method can be useful uh, in many of these problems. And we specifically discussed the two scenarios, and tensor SVD, and uh, we have described the algorithm, HOI, and uh, we say illustrate the theory, and the computational statistical trade-off, and uh, we achieve good performance in the 40 stem inch noise problem. And we mentioned about the tensor function tensor SVD, and uh, it's really powerful in analysis ana in analyzing the high dimension longitudinal longitudinal data like the longitudinal microbound data. And uh, we have br briefly mentioned the other topic. And uh, that's all I want to talk for today. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions now.